centralist officials began to transfer forces into Texas to actually enforce the law of April 6, 1830. President Anastasio Bustamante designated General Mier Itaran, Commandant General of the Eastern Interior Provinces. This new title carried with it the responsibility of supervising both civil and military affairs in the states of Tamaulipas, Coahuila, Nuevo Leon, and Texas. Tehran ordered the construction of six additional Texas presidios to prevent smuggling and impede American immigration. These initiatives resulted in a series of violent confrontations between American colonists and centralist troops. Traditional Texas histories euphemistically class these clashes as troubles or disturbances. Actually, these flare-ups were in the American tradition of civil disobedience, not unlike Shays' Rebellion or the Whiskey Rebellion, in which citizens challenged taxation they considered repressive and a government they deemed unresponsive. General Tehran established a presidio at Anahuac on Galveston Bay and placed Colonel Juan Davis Bradburn in command of the post. It was an ill-fated choice. Born in Virginia in 1787, his parents had christened him John Davis Bradburn. He came to Texas first as a filibuster, but later joined the fight for Mexican independence, changed his first name to Juan, rose through the ranks of the Mexican army, and became a dutiful and dedicated centralist. At first, American colonists in Anahuac received the news of Bradburn's appointment with great pleasure, but his haughty demeanor soon dampened their enthusiasm. His duties under the April 6 law included enforcing Mexican custom regulations, dispensing licenses to Anglo attorneys, and reviewing land titles. The Federalists had earlier granted the American immigrants tax exemptions, but the time allotted had expired. President Bustamante and his centralist cohorts envisioned that tariff revenues would cover the cost of the new presidios securing the approaches into Texas from the United States. To locals, Bradburn seemed officious beyond any purpose. Moreover, the depraved character of his troops, many of whom were convicted criminals serving out prison sentences with military service, became intolerable. An American by birth, many speculated that Bradburn, to prevent charges of favoritism, was more severe than a native Mexican might have been. Of course, as a centralist officer, it was his duty to dissuade American immigration. Nevertheless, he seemed to take too much enjoyment in his work. George Fisher was another former U.S. citizen that Anahuac settlers wished had remained at home. Appointed customs collector in 1831, he insisted ships would have to pay their duties to him in Anahuac but most American captains were bound for Velasco at the mouth of the Brazos River. Thus, they had to sail some 140 miles out of their way simply to satisfy the dictates of this niggling bureaucrat. That, and they further resented having to pay any Mexican tariffs at all. In 1832, matters came to a head when Bradburn arrested two mouthy lawyers Patrick Jack and William Barrett Travis, who had been trying to incite the locals to rebellion. On June 10, 1832, Anglo citizens in Anahuac determined to rescue the troublemakers 
and armed insurgents occupied a number of the town's buildings. In the skirmish that followed, five Centralist soldiers and one Anglo colonist died. After the clash, the rebels regrouped along Turtle Bayou and waited for the arrival of artillery, purportedly on the way from Rosoria. It was fortunate for the dissidents that news had arrived that General Antonio Lopez de Santana, an avowed Federalist and the erstwhile savior of Mexico, had launched a coup against Bustamante's centralist regime. Anglo insurgents, of course, favored the Federalist faction because it supported American immigration and states' rights. Indeed, during the June 10th skirmish, the mob at Anahuac took as their battle cry, Viva Santana! <laughs> Ironic, considering the role he would play in Texas just four years later. On June 13th, the Anahuac dissenters drafted what they called the Turtle Bayou Resolutions. In the document, they declared themselves loyal Mexicans who supported Santana and the Constitution of 1824. They insisted that they had taken up arms only to resist the present dynasty and its many despotic and arbitrary acts. On June 26, Rosario residents, employing a schooner armed with a cannon and between 100 and 150 riflemen, besieged Fort Velasco, commanded by Centralist Commandant Domingo de Ugartachea. Once they had exhausted all their ammunition, Ugartachea and his garrison hoisted the white flag. But the fighting had been fierce. The Anglo insurgents lost seven killed and 14 wounded. Three of the 14 later died of their wounds. The Centralist garrison suffered five killed and 16 wounded. Meanwhile, back in Attawak, Bradburn was feeling the pressure. He called on Centralist garrisons in Nacogdoches and San Antonio for reinforcements. On June 19th, Colonel Jose de las Piedras, commander of the Nacogdoches Presidio, led 100 troops southward to assist his beleaguered comrade. Fortunately for all concerned, Piedras was more diplomatic than Bradburn. When he arrived within 30 miles of Anahuac, he opened talks with the angry Anglo citizens, who supplied him with a list of grievances. Piedras offered a number of concessions. He agreed to reestablish a town council at Liberty, release Jack and Travis to civilian authorities, and demand Bradburn's resignation. On June 28th, the insurgents gladly accepted his terms. On July 1st, Piedras entered Anahuac without incident. Triumphant, the mob released Jack and Travis from their eight-week confinement. With order restored in Anahuac, Piedras returned to Nacogdoches. The poor man had no idea that he was riding into a maelstrom. Inspired by the events at Velasco and Anahuac, Anglo colonists in and around that Piney Woods community marched on the centralist garrison there. Like Bradburn, Piedras had angered the Anglo community by attempting to enforce centralist dictates. On August 2nd, after a bitter street fight, Piedras and his centralist garrison evacuated Nacogdoches and retreated toward Bear. Yet, members of the National Militia, under James W. Bullock and James Bowie, overtook them and forced their surrender. Piedras had suffered 47 killed and more than 40 wounded. With that, all Centralist forces found it prudent to flee eastern Texas. 
Shortly afterward, Travis boasted. Mexicans have learned a lesson. Americans know their rights and will assert and protect them. The young firebrand seemed to have forgotten that legally he was himself a Mexican. Presumably, he purposely remembered to forget it. The bloody episodes of 1832 may well have provoked a wider upheaval had cooler heads not prevailed. Although a centralist, Tehran interpreted the law of April 6 with remarkable restraint, instructing his officers to conduct themselves with discretion. Ironically, American settlers respected the native officers more than the American-born officials like the Martinet Bradburn and the busybody customs collector George Fisher. As he always did, Impresario Austin cautioned patience and temperance. But these clashes had not been mere disturbances. As many as 65 men lost their lives and dozens more suffered serious wounds. Most American colonists craved peace and scorned those agitators who had incited mayhem. More reflective men planned to assemble in October, and they proposed to defend their rights, not with bullets, but with a petition. 